Hello, everyone, and welcome to another CJS Noon Lecture. Um, my name is Anna Vojne, and I'm a PhD candidate in sociology department um, and as a graduate student working on contemporary Japanese society, gender, and the marriage market. I am very excited to introduce our distinguished speaker for today. Um, but before that, let me thank the CJS staff for organizing today's lecture. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jackson, Yuri, Barbara, and Robin for your hard work uh, on making this event happen. And I would like to begin with a few announcements from the center. So next week, uh, we are very pleased to announce uh, a panel discussion on the anniversary of the 311 Great East Japan disaster. 311, 10 years later, addressing gender disparity in Japan's disaster response. We're joined by three directors of Japan-based nonprofits who work with women affected by natural disasters and increased domestic violence. Teruko Kakikome from Women's Space Fukushima, uh, Reiko Masai from Women's Net Kobe, and Etsuko Yahata from Hearty Sendai. Uh, this event is organized and moderated by Dr. Mieko Yoshihama, a professor of social work here at the U of M. So please join us for this very special and timely event. For other programs scheduled in this series, please check out our CJS events page uh, or various social media sites. And for this event, attendee webcams and microphones have been muted. Um, but we invite you to use the Q&A function during the lecture to submit any questions you have, and the presenter will try to address as many as possible. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Mary Brinton, the Rice Shower Institute Professor of Sociology and the Director of the Rice Shower Institute of Japanese Studies uh, at Harvard University. Before Harvard, Dr. Brinton also taught at Cornell at the, and at the University of Chicago. Dr. Brinton is a preeminent expert on gender, family, um, economic, and demographic change in contemporary Japan. Uh, she's the author of several books and numerous articles and book chapters on the topics of gender, uh, shifting labor market conditions, uh, social policy, and their impact on family and the broader social structure. Some of her most recent publications include Singlehood in Contemporary Japan, Rating, Dating, and Waiting for a Good Match, which uh, just came out in demographic research a few weeks ago, and um, Babies Work or Both, Highly Educated Women's Employment and Fertility in East Asia, which was published in the American Journal of Sociology. She's also the author of several books, including Lost in Transition, Youth Work and Instability in Post-Industrial Japan, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2011, and which actually was first published in Japanese and then in English. Um, and in fact, uh, some of you might remember that Dr. Brenton presented research for that very book uh, some 10 years ago, uh, here during the CJS Noon Lecture Series, when Dr. Kyo Tsutsui, in, in trying to convey the impact of Dr. Brinton's work, uh, memorably compared her to Mariah Carey. And if you're curious, that uh, lecture can still be found on YouTube. Um, in addition to advancing an understanding of demographic issues in the Japanese context, uh, Dr. Brinton has also engaged in cross-national comparative studies of these problems. And her research has been funded by the National Science Foundation, Fulbright, and the Spencer Foundation, among many other prestigious institutions. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Brenton, whose talk today is entitled, How Japan Got It Wrong, Government Policy, Gender, and the Birth Rate. Thank you so much, Anna. That was a wonderful introduction. And I had forgotten that allusion to Mariah Carey <laughs> that Professor Tsutsui made. Um, it's horrifying to think that that was already 10 years ago, but it was. Um, I'm going to share my screen now uh, and begin.
So I want to say, first of all, um, one of the very few silver linings to the COVID-19 crisis is that we all get to be together one way or another, even though we can't be so um, in person. And uh, it's wonderful. Um, I don't know how many people are here, but I look very much forward to hearing your questions and comments after I speak. Um, I also wanted to just um, call out um, that some of my former research assistants and postdocs, I believe are attending today and I'm very, very happy to have them. So how Japan got it wrong, government policy, gender and the birth rate. I'm going to start by saying that Japan really faced faces two dilemmas in the early 20th, 21st century. Of course, many more than that, but two in particular. And the first, as we all know, is that Japan's population is very rapidly aging. In fact, it's aging faster than any other country's population. Now, this means in effect that Japan has a very low ratio of working age adults to adults over 65 years old. Why is that a problem? Well, it's certainly a problem for the pension system, which is going to be woefully inadequate in years to come. And it's related also to the second challenge, which is an economic one. And to the extent that a population is aging rapidly, this is generally associated with slower economic growth, low productivity, and of course, ballooning national debt, part, partly because of the pension issue, and labor shortages, which of course, Japan is already experiencing. So the demographic, demographic and economic challenges are closely intertwined with each other. Why are these challenges so large in Japan? As we know, Japan has a very low birth rate and Japan's birth rate has been low, not just recently, but for the past several decades. So I'm going to show you just to put Japan in context. Uh, um, in a moment, I'll show you birth rates across the post-industrial world and locate Japan. But first let's look at the population pyramid, so to speak. Um, this is how demographers portray the age structure of a population. And we can see over time visually that the population has aged greatly. So in 1950, Japan had a very young population, lots of people um, under 40 um, in the workforce and really in many um, respects, helping, helping to fuel Japan's rapid economic growth, the labor surplus. By 2005, things looked already very different. Of course, that's 55 years later, but not quite the present. And you can see here that there are two bulges, people around uh, age 30 and then people uh, approaching their 60s. And demographers in Japan for the last several years, because of the, quote, population crisis, have been making projections as to what the age structure might look like in Japan by 2055. And this is what they're projecting. And this has been quite stable over the past 15 years ago, this is, or so, this projection. So you can see this is a very aged population. And to translate it into kind of common sense terms, it's predicted by um, 2055 that four out of 10 Japanese people will be over age 65. And I wrote um, a, a piece, a journalism piece a few years ago, um, pointing out that already Japan, um, Japanese retailers are selling more adult diapers than they are baby diapers. Um, and the population size in Japan is beginning to shrink. Um, Korea has also just joined that dubious category of um, countries as well. So what are birth rates like in the rest of the world? This is just a very quick snapshot and I've broken the post-industrial world here into six different regions. And you can see in 1970, the, the 
aggregate or average birth rate in East Asia was very high. This was mainly because of South Korea and the fact that South Korea went through quite late industrialization um, compared to Japan and Taiwan. Um, and also because of China, family size was still high in, Ch in China. I'll show you Japan's birth rate in a moment. But the main thing I want you to see here is that there's been this tremendous compression, as demographers would put it, of birth rates over these years. And in no region of the post-industrial world uh, are birth rates at population replacement level, which is measured by demographers as 2.1 children on average per woman. The point one being um, taking into account some infant and child mortality. So for a population to be naturally replacing itself without in migration from outside the country, the average total fertility rate, which this is measuring, needs to be around 2.1. And you can see here, again, a thumbnail sketch of the fact that East Asia, the green dotted line, Southern Europe, the white line, and Eastern Europe, the light blue line, all have very low fertility rates now. The countries in all of those regions have very low birth rates. And so this has very much been um, an issue for European demographers, much less so for American demographers, I would say, because our birth rate in the US is declining, but it's nowhere near um, the low, low birth rates of East Asia or Southern Europe or Eastern Europe. So let's look at Japan. This shows what has happened with the Japanese birth rate over the last uh, almost 50 years. And you can see that there's been um, a steady decline. So in the early 1970s, Japan did have a population replacement birth rate, but it fell consistently throughout the 70s and 80s. There's a little bit of a bump up here. This is kind of magnified the scale of the graph. Um, I could talk about that little bump up um, later if, if people have questions. I wouldn't regard it as very significant, however, <clears throat> because you can see that Japan is kind of stabilized um, at a birth rate of around 1.4 children per woman, which is way, way below population replacement rate. Now, this is another way of looking at fertility. I'm going to back up a moment so that I can explain what you're going to see. A more accurate way of looking at countries' fertility, um, comparing countries to each other, is to look at what we call completed cohort fertility. So this measures, um, looks at past cohorts of women, say, we'll see in the next graph, for instance, um, women, born in the 1950s, 1960s, and so on, looks at how many children they ended up having in their, quote, reproductive lifespan. So usually we look at completed cohort fertility um, among women around age 45, because it's very, very unlikely that women above that age are going to have any more kids. So let me show you um, a comparison here. So this shows you that in 1950, women born in that year in Japan, Sweden, and the US, all had um, on average about two kids. And this persisted more or less through the mid 1950s. And then you see this, diverg this um, divergence. And you see indeed that Japan's birth rate kept falling. Sweden's was maintained at a remarkably stable level. And when fertility is measured in this way, cohort fertility in the United States has actually gone up a bit. So here again, you see the very um, consistent picture of Japan's falling birth rate. And you can appreciate for how long it's been falling. And this is really a very important factor um, feeding into the aging of the population. In other words, this is not a recent phenomenon. So given these many years of very low birth rates and the anticipated problems that are arising from rapid population aging, 
the Japanese government, as I think you are probably all familiar with, has designed policies that they hope will sim simultaneously be addressing two goals. The first one is to raise the labor force participation rate of married women, especially mothers. Why? Because that can alleviate current labor market shortages, labor shortages rather. The second goal is to increase the country's birth rate in order to forestall very serious future labor shortages. Again, immigration would be another possible supplementary solution. Um, we can talk about that later if you'd like to. It's not been regarded as a major solution by the Japanese government. Now, how about um, mothers employed? Um, these data I was only able to find um, since 2009 for Sweden, and I'm making the comparisons here um, with Sweden and the United States, mainly because they have much higher birth rates than Japan does. And you can see here that in fact, um, the employment rate of mothers in Japan has converged with the employment rate of mothers in the US. Um, it wasn't terribly different in 2009. It had been coming up before then. And then it converges with the U.S. and actually slightly exceeds the employment rate of mothers in the U.S. by 2018. Sweden's um, employment of mothers has been consistently very, very high. And I could also speak to that um, if people are interested later. <clears throat> so... In terms of this goal, I would say, okay, we'll give it a, a check. Um, this has been um, happening in Japan. The labor force participation of married women, especially moms, has been going up. Uh, more women are staying in the labor market, certainly after they get married, um, and more women are staying in the labor market after they have their first child as well. This one, no, not much progress right? The birth rate has really not budged um, as a result of policies or anything else in the last several years in Japan. So what's the problem? <clears throat> well, as I said in a, a moment ago, European, de European demographers have been very actively studying low birth rates because it's been such an issue in many parts of Europe. And social demographers in Europe have argued that there's a crucial link between these two. What is it? Gender equality in the workplace and in the household. They've argued that this is a very important um, factor that affects birth rates. Now, I'm gonna back up for just a second and say in some ways, Japanese policymakers have gotten things right. What do I mean by that? Well, it used to be the case that when we looked at the female labor force participation rate in a country, it was negatively correlated or negatively related with the country's birth rate. So I'm going to show you a graph from the 19 from 1980. And here you can see that the countries that had indeed high female labor force participation, such as Sweden, Finland, Norway, US is here had lower birth rates, right? Japan is, is kind of right here in the middle. Korea is way, way over here. Um, so there was a negative relationship between female labor force participation at the aggregate level and the country's birth rate. However, by 1990, this had changed. There was a positive relationship. So here you see, well, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark is way over here. Um, New Zealand, the US had higher birth rates and higher female labor force participation rates. So when demographers first noticed this, they were really intrigued. We don't often as sociologists um, witness a case where a phenomenon, uh, the relationship between two phenomena reverses direction in a short period of time. But indeed, this um, relationship has continued um, since 1990. So what demographers argue to explain this is that post-industrial countries that have made it possible for women to balance work and family 
are the ones that haven't suffered large declines in their birth rates. And again, the Northern European countries would be kind of the classic textbook case. And so the logic is that as women participate at higher and higher rates in the workforce, especially married women and moms, there needs to be greater gender equality at home, namely in housework and childcare, because that will lessen women's second shift. Second shift is a frequent phrase used by gender inequality specialists in sociology. It comes from Arlie Hochschild's classic study of many years ago of women who were working in the labor market and of course working at home. And she argued that in effect, women have a second shift or two jobs, such women. So there needs to be um, a better balance, a changed balance um, gender-wise in the home in terms of men and women sharing housework and childcare. And European demographers have been arguing that if that happens, then couples who want to have two or more children will be more likely to do so. Um, they'll be willing and enthusiastic to go ahead and do that. And many empirical studies over the past 15 years or so have demonstrated indeed this link between a more gender balanced division of labor at home and higher birth rates. And these studies have been uh, conducted at the national level, so cross-nationally, and also at the couple level, looking um, within countries and looking at couples that have um, more or less equal divisions of labor in the household and whether they go on and have a second or possibly even a third child. So on balance, empirical studies have shown that this link is quite strong. Now, as probably most of us know, Japan and Korea are almost tied for having um, the lowest participation of men in housework. So in Japan, uh, men on average do about 15% of the total household work. And here I am referring by household work to housework and childcare. In the US, um, men are currently doing almost 40% on average of household work. And in your Northern Europe, they do over 40%. So, one, one takeaway from this graph is also that in no country are men and women equally sharing household work, but in some countries it's getting much closer to that than in other countries, such as the ones over here. And coincidentally, Japan, Korea, Portugal, Greece, and Italy all have very low birth rates. So I generally agree with European demographers assessment of the situation and they're theorizing that gender inequality um, really exerts a, a dampening effect on family formation, um, mainly due to this time squeeze that mothers face between home and workplace. But in the work I'm doing currently, I shift the focus a bit to the negative effects of the male breadwinner, female carer model of the family. So what does that shift in focus uh, involve? Well, uh, the male breadwinner model or the male breadwinner female carer model of the family is really very much based on what we call gender essentialist beliefs about the different roles that men and women play. So women are more suited for home, home work, um, childcare, and so forth, and men are more suited for the market. Um, and this kind of model presupposes and supports gender role specialization. And I argue that this is really what we should be focusing on. Gender equality, yes, um, it's important, but there's a reason, again, which I can discuss in the Q&A, why gender equality is not the whole story. Um, and this involves some other work that I'm doing. So I, I'm arguing that with strong gender role specialization, birth rates are not going to increase. And Japan, unfortunately, is a textbook case of this. And I'm also going to argue 
that the design of Japanese work family policies so far has actually strengthened, not broken down gender role specialization. Now, we're all familiar with former Prime Minister Abe's womenomics policy, um, which was aimed to create an environment in which women find it comfortable to work, or more euphemistically, an environment where women can shine. Um, and indeed, as I've shown, the recent increase in Japanese women's labor force participation to a level above the US is quite, um, quite marked, and it's been lauded as a great achievement by um, the um, former and current administrations in Japan. However, the greatest increase in women's employment in Japan has been in women's share of non-regular precarious jobs. Okay, why does that matter for the birth rate? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, Japanese work family policies generally apply only to regular employees. So employees with indefinite contracts or in Japanese seishain. And currently less than 50% of all Japanese female employees are seishain. And the rest are in so-called irregular contingent um, jobs with short contracts generally. Second, Japan is not reaping the economic gains possible from having a young, highly educated female population, um, especially because so many women are in these um, kind of second class, uh, second tier um, contingent irregular jobs and not in seishain jobs. Uh, I looked at um, OECD st statistics to see um, if I could find the proportion of women in each country um, who participate in the labor market based on their education. And what I found was kind of shocking to me. Japan, along with South Korea and Turkey are the only OECD countries that have a substantial gap in the participation rates of men, highly educated men and women in the labor market. So, this is the table I created. Again, I'm doing a comparison with the US and Sweden um, as countries that have much higher birth rates than Japan. And the takeaway point here is that highly educated Japanese women have a labor force participation rate that's almost 20% below highly educated men. And in Sweden, basically the same um, proportions of highly educated men and women participate in the, in the labor force. And in the US, there's a difference, but it's half the difference between men and women as is demonstrated in Japan. A third, and oh, another part of the utilization of women um, in the labor force, if we wanna say utilization, um, is that despite prime, former Prime Minister Abe's administration's goal to have 30% of leadership positions occupied by women by 2020, in fact, um, the current rate is less than half that. And again, Japan and South Korea are together in having the lowest female share of managerial employment of any post-industrial country. Um, there's also been a lot of um, publicity um, in Japan and elsewhere about Japan's very, very low ranking um, um, in the gender global gender gap um, index, which is created um, every year reported by the World Economic Forum. Japan and South Korea are by far the lowest ranking countries on gender equality across the post-industrial world. Um, and much of their low ranking is attributed to the fact that there are so few women in both countries in economic and political leadership positions. And also that the parity, the um, women's um, labor market rewards are so far um, removed from, what, from men's labor market re rewards. Um, 
finally, um, there's been a wonderful study published by my former colleague at the University of Chicago. He's, he's still there, Kazuo Yamaguchi. Um, he wrote uh, this book. It was translated from the Japanese. Um, it's quite technical. Um, Kaz is uh, completely a quantitative person, but it's a very, very good examination of uh, Japanese firms' discrimination against women, and in particular, the extent to which they underuse the highly educated women that they hire. Okay, so I am um, writing a book um, like Lost in Transition um, that I wrote about 10 years ago. I'm writing a book that is first going to appear in Japanese. So I'm working with Chuo Koron Shinsha, an editor there. And um, my book will be delivered to him. Um, he'll suggest revisions. This is all gonna happen in the next two months. He's read every chapter I've written so far. So he's been keeping abreast of what I'm doing, but the book will be translated into Japanese and published um, this year. Why am I doing that? Because I really want the things I'm saying to reach um, hopefully a broad um, audience. In Japan. So the book is not, um, to the best of my ability, it's not super academic. And I've got um, a bunch of people reading it for me, some of whom I think are in the audience today, to sort of see how readable it is, how engaging it is, and so forth. Um, and I very much hope that it will reach policymakers and get their attention as well. Um, after that, I will redo the book. Um, um, for Harvard University Press, and actually the US will be a little more front and center with Japan and Sweden as comparative cases. Oops, excuse me. So in the book, I use comparative country level data to show how strong gender essentialist assumptions underlie the gender division of household labor, the structure of the labor market, and workplace practices and norms in Japan. And I also make extensive use of primary qualitative data, which again is what my RAs and, and my postdoc really, really helped me with. So we did structured in-depth interviews in multiple countries to analyze how men and women make decisions about work and family and how those decisions are affected by these features of, of the context, the household division of labor, the structure of the labor market and workplace practices and norms. So in my book, I um, am arguing that enduring gender essentialism in Japan has thwarted any positive effect that policy measures would exert on the birth rate. And I'm going to do two things for the remainder of the talk. First, I'm going to show you a few examples of how I use both types of data, the macro level data, I'll be very brief on that, and the micro level data, so to speak, from the interviews. And then I'm going to come back to this um, main argument that gender essentialism and men's and women's role specialization have really been reinforced, not broken down by Japan's work family policies. So here I am showing you um, the relationship between the total fertility rate in the country on the, on the um, vertical axis and women's versus men's proportion of unpaid work. Now, what I mean by that is I looked at um, the total number of minutes on average, women work every day and men work every day. And in most countries, it's very, very similar. However, the degree to which that work is comprised of unpaid work in the home and paid work in the market is very, very different. So basically in Japan, women do five times as much unpaid labor in their total workload than men do. Korea 
is close. In the US, Sweden, Denmark, Australia, these other countries, women, um, women's and men's share of unpaid labor and their total work time every day is much more similar to each other. Again, there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, complete you know, gender equality in any country, but the countries in the upper left-hand corner are getting pretty close and lo and behold, they have higher birth rates. And I look, I look at this through many different lenses in the, in the book manuscript and the result is really always the same. The more um, unpaid work women do on average in a country and especially the more unpaid work relative to their total workload compared to men, um, the lower the fertility rate is. So I'm gonna focus mainly on the primary qualitative data and just say a few words about the interviews. And then as with the other things I've talked about so far, um, you're welcome to ask me whatever questions you have in the Q&A. So we did parallel, meaning the same um, exact interview protocol, in-depth structured interviews with highly educated urban adults, age 24 to 35 in Japan, the US and Sweden. And also we did these interviews also in Spain and uh, South Korea. Um, in the book I'm writing, I'm focusing on these three cases, Japan and the two higher fertility cases. And in each country, we uh, sampled 80 individuals, which is very small in demographic terms. It's pretty big in uh, qualitative researchers terms. Um, the sample split between men and women. And initially we interviewed um, these people um, in 2012. And they're all, again, urban, in urban, highly urban areas. And then in the last couple of years, um, I've been um, organizing and, and having follow-up interviews done in Japan and the US. And um, these have been, it's amazing. It's, it's uh, amazing to see what's happened in people's lives over this seven to eight years. Um, and that's also forming an important part of the book manuscript that I'm working on. So I'm gonna just show you two um, examples of how I'm using the qualitative data. The first example has to do with how Japanese married interviewees reason about how they divide housework. And the second has to do with how our Japanese interviewees talk about men's child care leave, the idea of men's child care. So with the first um, interviews in 2012, um, in our sample, wives did about 70% of the housework on average and 80% of childcare. And it's probably um, you know, a little less dramatic than the uh, national rate where men do about 15% on average of total household work. Uh, because these are highly educated couples um, and living in urban areas. But in about one third of the households represented in our qualitative data, wives were doing 90 to 100% of the household. So how do people rationalize this highly gendered division of labor? Well, in one of the articles, um, that was mentioned earlier in, in the nice introduction that was given for the talk. Um, I talk about how women as, as well as men tend to say that the household division of labor is what it is because of the work demands that men face. So an example is Chie. And when we first interviewed Chie, she was working full time as a contingent worker, hijokin, in a clerical job in a government ministry. Her husband was a sales representative in the cargo division of an airline company. And when we asked her about the division of labor in her household, this is what she commented. And I'm, I'm going, those who know Japanese can read the quote, I'm going to read it in English translation for those who don't speak Japanese. She says, of course, I would prefer that he, her husband, come home a little earlier. And I don't want him to bring his work home and open up his laptop. 
I don't like it when he spreads his documents on the dining table, but I think there is no choice. The well-known shikataka nai in Japanese. That's part of his work and it's something he's willing to do. So what is most striking about the rationale offered by both men and women in our Japanese um, interviews uh, is that they refer to uh, the structure of work as being the problem. There was very little blame, blame, so to speak, attributed by Japanese wives to their husbands, although sometimes some frustration was expressed. But it was very interesting to me because few of our interviewees believed the conventional kind of um, belief that we've all, the phrases that we've all heard in Japanese over the years that women belong at home and men belong outside. Very few people subscribe to that um, generic belief. However, the division of household labor um, is rationalized by virtually all of our interviewees. Um, and men and women have pretty much the same rationalization. So this is another example. This is Taiki. And he, uh, when we interviewed him in 2012, he was working in the accounting strategy department of a very large Japanese bank. And this is what he says. He says, first of all, he says nearly all the employees in his company are men, which is very um, accurate in the finance industry, very true. And he says, the male employees at my company are traditionally, are traditional so-called sarariman. As for myself, I don't do anything at home except on weekends. And then he says, actually, even on weekends, I do very little. <laughs> So he's very upfront about the fact that he's just not participating much at home. And this shows, um, you know, as a background context for that, the fact that, again, Japan and Korea have the highest percentage of male employees who work long hours. 50 hours doesn't sound like very, very long for American academics or for um, people in East Asian countries, but that's the standard that OECD uh, uses. Um, anybody working over 50 hours gets counted and um, as you know, working long hours. And in Japan and Korea, this is over 20% of male employees and in the um, Nordic countries, it's fewer than 5%. How about our interviewees' use of childcare leave and their attitudes about new fathers taking childcare leave? To put it in context, Japan now has one of the most generous maternity and childcare leave policies for women and one of the most generous paternal leave policies among all middle and high income countries. And there have been a series of increasingly more generous policy reforms over the, it, that have been enacted by the Japanese government over the, over the past few decades. Maternity leave, which has been guaranteed um, since in the labor standards law since um, the early post-war period is um, six weeks before a child's birth and eight weeks following birth. And during those weeks, um, a, a mother will be compensated at 67% of her wage rate before she went on leave. And there's been a gradual increase in the wage replacement rate for new mothers or fathers taking parental or childcare leave and started out very low, 25%, but now it's up to 67% for the first six months of leave. And after that, it's 50% of the wages that either the mother or the father um, was making before he or she took childcare. The parent, parental leave entitlement is 12 months, and it can be extended to 14 months if the father takes some of the leave. And this is following the example of a number of Nordic countries. Um, and as you know, there's very high quality public childcare in Japan, um, which 
costs money, but it's not very costly because it's highly subsidized by the government. Uh, the government has been endeavoring to eliminate the waiting list for spaces at public child care facilities. That has not, um, that goal has not been reached in large urban areas. And in fact, many, many of the moms um, that we re-interviewed in 2019 um, had to extend, had had to extend their childcare leave because they were, they were waiting um, to get their um, baby in, an infant toddler into childcare. Um, a large percentage of Japanese female employees who are eligible to take childcare leave do so. And as I said earlier, this is generally only seishain. Um, and among Seishain, which is less than half the female labor force, 82% um, took child care leave. This is a major, major change in Japan. Now, Prime Minister Abe's administration aimed to double the proportion of Japanese men who take parental leave, hoping that they could raise it to 13% by um, 2020. The percentage doubled, but it doubled from 3% to 7% of eligible Japanese male employees. And I devote the whole chapter of my book to, to this. The average, average length of childcare leave taken by Japanese women versus that taken by Japanese men is very different. I looked at the statistics and Japanese women um, are, more Japanese women are taking long leaves than um, in the late 90s. Um, nearly 40% took at take at least 40 at, at least uh, 12 months, and again the extensions are often because there's not a childcare space for their um, child. Average length of childcare leave by Japanese men has gone down over time. Um, in 1999. Of the few men who took childcare leave, and it really was a few at that time. 60% took less than two weeks off. And now that's more than 70% of men who take childcare leave. So the amount of time that men and women take leave is very different. It's also different, again, in the Nordic countries, it's quite different. Although the percentages of men who take childcare leave are very, very, very high compared to Japan. Um, none of our male interviewees um, had taken child care leave when we interviewed them in 2012 or in the eight years since then, unless we count Nanako's husband. And Nanako says that her husband looked into taking child care leave and he wanted to, but it turned out that it would be unpaid. This was in 2012. So she says, ultimately, we decided that he would participate in childcare on the weekends. Um, she says he would have taken leave if it were paid. His company offers two days off when your child is born. So he used those days to turn in our baby's birth certificate. I'm going to show you one more quote and then I want to wrap up so that we'll have plenty of time for questions. So this is what Takeshi said when we asked him about his opinion on men taking childcare leave. Just because men are told they can take childcare leave doesn't mean it's all been prepared or set up. There needs to be more support in practice. Even in an environment where it seems okay to take it, men who take childcare leave face criticism. We need to create a trend that it's good and easy for men to take childcare leave. Um, at the time we interviewed him, the original interview, Takeshi was the principal of a juku cram school and his wife was working um, part-time about 32 hours a week in a clerical job. He and his wife were both in their late twenties and they were looking forward to having children. When we asked Takeshi if anyone at his workplace had taken childcare leave, he said yes. But then he quickly clarified that it had only been women who had done so. He knew of no men who had taken leave. Shino, 
um, is typical of married female interviewees in our sample who are not in favor of their husbands taking child. When we asked whether she and her husband had discussed the possibility that he would take child care leave, she said no. She told us that she had considered it a tadimai that she would take it and her husband wouldn't. I, she said, I think that taking leave would have repercussions for his success at work. So once again, reference to the workplace, at least in the current Japan we are living in. This is because companies don't have enough understanding and acceptance of childcare leave. That was not the only reason though, that she didn't want her husband to take leave. As we continued the discussion, she added, I think it's impossible for fathers to take child care leave, it would be tough. After all, men generally make more money than women do. So if a man takes leave, then it would be difficult financially for the household. So this is a reflection, obviously, um, of the fact that Japanese men's and women's earnings on average are very different. Women earn, um, on average, about 75% of men's income or wages in Japan. Okay, I'm going to finish up um, and talk briefly about the work family policies and what went wrong. So as I have said, the work family policies have focused on adjustments for working mothers, um, but they have not disrupted the fundamental conditions of regular full-time employment or the gender essentialist assumptions that I've discussed. Workplace conditions for regular employees, especially at large firms, as we know, involve long work hours. Employees are generally subject to job transfers, including to other parts of the country without being consulted. And HR departments in Japanese firms have tended to be very centralized. So decisions about job responsibilities, job rotation transfers, and other personnel matters have been made quite centrally and have exhibited quite a lot of inflexibility with regard to what employees themselves want um, in terms of a, adaptation um, to their family circumstances or personal circumstances, and also what they want in terms of developing their skills over time. Um, work family policies, entirely oriented again towards women. There's been the creation of a special employment status for mothers. It's not designated for mothers, but it's only mothers who um, take this. Restricted regular employee. Um, location restricted, meaning you don't agree to be transferred. Some men take that, but the larger category is jitan, short work hour option. And this is generally offered by large companies until the child is three years old. So it involves working until generally until 4 p.m. and not doing um, any work beyond that and certainly not any overtime work. Again, it wouldn't have to be the mom who takes this, but I have seen of no cases. I've seen no cases where men take it. And then again, this option of extending childcare leave past one year. If it's women who are taking childcare leave in the first place, they're the ones who extend it. And this means that they're away from the workplace even longer. So these gender specific policies reinforce the idea that women's main responsibility is in the home and the workplace is only a secondary responsibility for them. And they also don't really encourage, the policies don't really encourage men to be more, become more active in family life through taking childcare leave or shortening their work hours. So the policies to my mind have not helped increase the birth rate because they have not focused on dislodging gender role specialization in the home and in the labor market. And this is not, completely the case with work family policies in other countries. And I've, I've looked at Sweden quite carefully because I talk about Sweden in the second to last chapter of my current book. And what's really interesting about Sweden is that the policies began a long time ago, work family policies, and they were not explicitly pronatalist. They were not designed to increase the birth rate. They were actually designed 
to make it more um, feasible for couples who wanted to have two children to have them, um, two or three children. And they were also explicitly not pronatalist, but quite explicitly gender egalitarian, um, oriented towards both people in the couple, um, working in the labor market and also working at home. So what we call the dual earner, dual carer model, not the male breadwinner model. And I'll just remind you that um, this is what completed cohort fertility looks like, you know, over these many years. Um, Sweden and Japan were neck and neck um, for women born in, in 1950 or the early 50s. Women had about the same number of children in both countries. And there was a strong divergence after that. Um, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, all um, needed to put some incentives in their childcare leave policy to try to get men um, um, to take childcare leave. Um, and um, Japan is trying to do that as well, but it hasn't worked. Um, but all along, as I said, Swedish policy has been formulated on the assumption that gender equality has a positive effect on fertility. And gender equality is not a goal of the Japanese work family policies. So in general, I would say that gender neutral work family policies could possibly have positive effects on, fam on family life, certainly on family life, and maybe on the birth rate. Because then all adults, not just women, would be earners and carers. So to develop these types of policies, it's crucial to support the idea that work-family balance is not just a women's issue. It's often labeled as a women's issue, to be fair, in the United States. Um, it's almost always labeled as a women's issue in Japan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brinton, very much for this um, fascinating presentation. We already have a number of questions in the Q&A, but please feel free to type more as we uh, continue our discussion. Um, and our first question is from Chieko Nakajima, uh, who's uh, saying the Japanese birth rate is decreasing and at the same time, fewer people are getting married. So how does the marriage rate fit into your discussion? Yeah, that's a very, very important question. And in fact, even though I have focused in this talk on you know, the relationship between the genders in terms of the amount and type of work they do and so forth, and the influence of the workplace. Um, so I've really you know, focused a lot on couples. Um, in point of fact, uh, the Japanese birth rate, the main driver of the low birth rate is, as you point out, the low marriage rate. Um, so a little bit of negative effect persists from the fact that people, um, married couples, some of them have one child. Almost nobody has three, a few people have three children, but um, the number of children born um, within couples is very low in Japan, but a much bigger reason um, in recent years for the very low birth rate is indeed that fewer and pe fewer people are getting married. Um, it's amazing, the percentages, I don't have them um, in my slides, but the percentages of um, men and women who are remaining single in Japan uh, into their 40s, which probably means they're going to stay single for the rest of their lives, are very, very, those percentages are very, very high. Um, and there's really interesting work. Um, being done on this. Jim Bramo is doing a lot of work on it. Um, and uh, as Anna said, I just recently published a paper on it. Um, so I think um, there's a lot to be said about it. Um, there's a sense in which a lot of young people say that they want to get married, but they're not really making active efforts to find a partner. Um, and uh, 
in our paper that was recently published in demographic research, we found that Japanese women continue to want to marry someone who, you know, is a seishain, of course, a regular employee and has a stable job and a good income. Um, and Japanese women are caring less and less, according to our data, about the education of um, the man. And that's been showing up actually in um, work done by uh, Setsuya Fukuda in Japan. Um, he's shown that men are getting a little bit more interested in um, the woman they marry having an income, not a high income necessarily, but having some income because it's hard to survive in Japan on just one income. Um, and women are continuing to value men with a high income. But, you know, there are a lot of different theories out there for um, why few, fewer and fewer Japanese men and women are marrying. And one, one theory, in fact, it was the title of a book that you might have read, Drift, The Drift into Singlehood, that it just it just kind of passes people by. They're not naturally meeting people of the opposite sex in their daily life. Um, and they want to get married, but it just, it just doesn't happen. And I think that's much more common than outright rejection of marriage um, by either sex. But in any case, um, your point is extremely well taken. And I do have um, interviews, an equivalent number of interviews with single people um, in our in our data set, but I did not include them in the book because it uh, because I didn't have space, and I I'm not sure if I'm going to write a separate book just on singlehood. I I may not because again other people are are working on the issue and making some progress on it. Thank you. And um, our next question is from Barbara Anderson. Uh, how do you assess the importance of male work in the home compared to male to male attitudes and compared to social policies that make being a mother and a worker more possible? So um, can I clarify, how do I assess, assess the weight of the male role, the importance? The importance of male work in the home compared to male attitudes and compared to social policies that make being a mother and a worker more possible? I mean, it's a big ball of wax, right? All of those things are related to each other. Um, in our data, frankly, it's hard, to, it's hard to tell how Japanese men really feel about doing housework because again, the, the recourse is, well, I can't do it because I don't get home till nine o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night, right? Um, so it's hard to tell, you know, how our interviewees really feel. Um, it, I think it's a very complicated issue, men's role in the home. Um, some women feel that their husbands are so inept and inexperienced that they don't even want them trying, you know, to wash the dishes or, or cook or whatever. Um, it's, it's very tough and government policy really cannot, you know, um, insert itself into the household, obviously. Um, paternity leave is different. Um, in the last chapter of my book, which I need to start writing very soon, um, I assess Japanese interviewees at um, attitude or response to the question, should, should male paternity leave be mandatory? And the majority of our interviewees said yes. And they're, their viewpoints are so perceptive. Many people said, unless it's mandatory, it's not gonna happen because it's, it's, really, it's really too hard for Japanese men to kind of be pioneers in their workplace. Um, I, I can understand why many um, don't take paternity leave even if the policy is on the books. It's just really, a lot of Japanese employers make it really, really difficult. Um, uh, I think, yeah, I think the government has done a pretty good job making it possible for um, mothers to work. I mean, the daycare system is 
far, far beyond anything we have in this country. It's not even on the horizon in this country. Um, I don't think, maybe, maybe it is. It hasn't been. Um, daycare is good. There's very, very high, a very high level of trust in public childcare. Um, people generally prefer it over private daycare centers, partly because of the licensing and approval that public daycare centers have to go through. So there's a high level of institutional trust. Um, you know, the, a mommy track has been established, right? For women. And um, I have a lot of women in our sample um, who are on this short work hour option right now when we interviewed them in the last year. Um, and can't, you know, can't quite tell yet how it's going to pan out for them, but most of them say they're not given very much responsibility. Um, and because, um, you know, the measurement of productivity in Japanese companies, to be honest, has been so crazy based mainly on FaceTime you're not evaluated very highly if you leave at four o'clock every day. So, you know, there are lots and lots of calls um, in Japan um, to measure productivity differently, but um, that's got to change. Otherwise, work style, work styles were not, will not change in Japan. I mean, if men keep working, you know, 60 hours, 70 hours a week so that they can get good evaluations from their managers, then all the stuff I said, is, it's not gonna happen. Um, and women will never be on a par with men if that continues. There's a, there's a big hataraki kata keikaku, a big work, um, work style reform that has been in effect in a, for a couple of years in Japan. And that's helping, um, but Employers don't necessarily have a lot of incentive to tell everybody to go home at 6 p.m., even if the government wants them to. I hope that answered your question in part, at least. Thank you. Um, so next up, we have two questions about the relationship of your research with um, elder care. And uh, Heidi mm -hmm. Gottfried says, uh, thank you for your excellent presentation. And in addition to child care, can you discuss elder care as a burden on women in familiar, familiaristic welfare states, including Japan and sovereign European states? Exactly. And we have a related question from um, John Campbell, uh, who says, if you were doing this talk 20 years ago, a big emphasis would have been on the burden of uh, caring for elderly relatives on women and preventing them from working. Uh, mm -hmm. With long-term care insurance from uh, 2000, Japan has led most of the world in lightening this burden. So has this impacted um, employment? Yeah, thank you. Um, those are very, very good questions. Um, I'm going to escape them, um, um, at least for our data, because the data that the age group that we focused on was 25 to 34, 24 to 35, actually. Um, so in our qualitative data, qualitative interviews, we really focused on, you know, that point in people's lives where they're trying to figure out if they're going to get married. Once they're married, they're trying to figure out when to have a kid, whether they have a second kid. So we're really focusing on that kind of, if you want to say transition to you know, full adulthood as it's thought of in Japan. So among our interviewees, we don't have enough people who have really old parents, you know, for me to be able to talk about this issue. But um, it, so I can't say too much, at least speaking, you know, sticking to the data that we have, I can't say too much. Um, I can say a little bit about how people talk about their parents and their parents-in-law. Of course, since we have um, a highly urban sample of people. There are many, many cases where parents don't live close by, um, parents-in-law don't live close by. Um, people, you know, at this age, in their late 20s, early 30s, certainly don't express much responsibility. You know, they don't feel like their parents are going to ask them to take 
to take care of them in old age. There's, there's no sense of that. Um, it's quite striking. Um, and our Korean interviews were quite different from that. Um, and there's also no sense of, which contrasts with our American interviews a lot. There's no sense in which people might move to be together, either the parents moving close to, the, to this younger generation or the younger generation moving, you know, probably to Inaka. Um, to be with the older generation. And in our American interviews, even though the sample is so similar, highly urban, um, you know, high, highly educated people, they're in the same age group. There are a lot of examples of people saying, well, you know, we moved from Boston to Minneapolis, not only because it's cheaper in Minneapolis, but because my parents are there and they can help take care of our our, our child. Um, so there's a lot more, um, there's a feeling of a lot more family interaction and decision, tandem um, decision making in the American interviews. But part of that I think is attributable to the fact that we have such a mobile labor market. I mean, you know, a lot of Japanese men, if they, if they did land a good job when they got out of school, they're not counting on, they're certainly not counting on moving to a different part of the country and looking for a job. Whereas that's, it's very different in the United States. But anyway, I suspect that um, the generation we're looking at, you know, will be consistent with what you said, John, that um, there's not going to necessarily be a big burden on them personally um, to take care of their parents. But um, and they, and they certainly don't feel at this age, they don't feel that their parents are expecting that. Um, so we have two uh, more technical questions. Uh, first one is from Yoni Seiden. How evenly distributed across the population is the childbirth rate? And are some women having many children, but most women having uh, few or no births? And how does it vary by household income and or education? Mm -hmm. And we also have a related question from Brandon Brathwaite um, asking what were the criteria for being included in the highly educated um, category? Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, because I had very little time to talk about the sample. So to the first question, um, the main um, social class or income or education gradient in Japan now is not the number of children you have, but whether you get married or not. So, you know, men at the bottom of the class structure, social class structure who got caught in the trap that I talked about in my um, Lost in Transition book, a lot of those guys, you know, high school graduates, they're not married and it doesn't look like they're gonna get married because they can't be a good breadwinner, right? If you still have this kind of breadwinner model of the family, then men who are who have had a string of irregular jobs, their women are not really anxious. You know, they're not lining up to marry these guys. Um, and you know, related to that, women with low education in Japan are not marrying at very high rates. Again, they the people they would marry are probably those guys. If they try to marry, if they try to look for, um, you know, Semon Gakko graduate, maybe, maybe one of those guys. But I think it's less and less the case that high school educated women in Japan are able to marry a university educated man, because the university ed educated women are after those guys. So, you know, it's, there's a really strong class gradient. Um, and education and income gradient in marriage. Once people marry, I don't think the number of children being born in a household differs very much by education and income anymore. But you know, it's an interesting thing because people have so few children that there's not a whole lot of variation that can take place. Um, we do have people in our sample who've had three kids. Um, in, you know, in the seven or eight years between 2012, 2020, 
um, let me speak to the sample in just a second. But geographically, yeah, there's a there's there's a quite a quite a difference in the birth rate by prefecture, um, with um, Tokyo you know, and Osaka um, leading the pack in terms of having the lowest birth rates. And a lot of that is cost of living. Um, and uh, anyway, so there is a gradient. So I can't say I'm talking about all of Japan when, when I um, talk about our interview sample because it's urban, very urban, nobody in the countryside. In terms of the selection, so since this was originally a five country study, you know, with um, different educational systems in some of these countries, what we decided was that we would include anyone who completed some level of education past high school. So this means that um, in the Japanese sample, we have university graduates, also semongako graduates and tandai graduates. So it's higher education um, broadly defined. Not everybody is a university graduate. And it's, it's really the bulk of the population because um, now, I think probably about 15 or 16 percent of Japanese people um, stop their education with high school. So everybody, you know, almost everybody's highly educated if you include Tandai and especially if you include Semongako. Right. Um, our next two questions are also interrelated. Um, so Bridget Cooper asks, if you can explain why Japan hasn't allowed uh, for increased immigration, if that's one effective way to uh, increase population. And uh, Yoni Saiden also asks um, that about the United States, which has no universal family leave policy, yet our fertility, fertility rate is far higher uh, than Japan. So why is mm -hmm. that the case? Does this indicate that leave is less important to fertility than we think? And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I thought these questions speak to one another. Yeah, um, so um, I'll take them in order, but uh, yeah, I'll take them in order. Um, the Japanese government doesn't use the word immigration formally. Migration, yes. But um, if anybody you know, has seen government websites that talk about immigration per se, please send them to me. Um, it's just a very, very uh, difficult issue in Japan. Um, the the migrate in migration, not immigration, but in migration policies um, have not been very inclusive of families immigrating. So you know, coming for five years as a skilled worker. Yeah, but how about your family? Um, it's it just gets into all kinds of issues, you know, having to do with well, the language is really hard, and can foreigners really master the language or not? And where are they going to live? And um, will people be, um, you know, able to accept them? And on and on and on. And uh, it's just, it has not been seen as a serious solution to the population problem. Um, Korea, you know, has been very different, whether it's been successful or not. Actually, the Korean birth rate is horrendously low. It's below 1.0 as we speak. But um, Korea has been much more welcoming on paper of people from other countries. Japan, Again, we could debate about this or talk about it for many, many hours, but um, it just hasn't been seen as a solution. Let me say one more thing about it. You know, in, in earlier days when um, Japanese um, farmers were having trouble finding wives, um, you know, quite a few women um, came to Japan from Southeast Asia and it did not always go well to put it mildly, um, a woman of a different ethnicity in a highly rural area doesn't speak the Japanese language, is dealing with a Japanese mother-in-law. Um, you know, that's not quite fair because um, immigrants, of course, many could come to large cities, but um, in any case, it's, 
it's not been considered a major solution. And some, some people thought I should be trying to talk about immigration in this book, but, but I decided not to because it's, it's got so many interrelated complexities to it. Um, at US, yeah. So US is a really weird case. I mean, when I look at the lack of provisions for families in this country, it makes me think, why does anybody have kids in this country? <laughs> I mean, the conditions are just so bad compared to other post-industrial countries. We don't even have guaranteed paid maternity leave, um, which Japan has had for decades. Um, so people rely on the market, right? Um, I mean, Americans maybe, maybe because they need to, have much, much more open attitudes about who's gonna take care of your kids. Most Japanese say, oh, babysitter. Many people we talked to um, don't even know what a nanny is. Um, many people in Japan, babysitter, you know, the, the kind of standard reaction, you would let somebody you don't know into your house. Um, not very many Americans say that. Um, you know, we have many, many different ways of um, getting childcare for our kids while we're working. Um, public childcare is not one of those ways. Um, and if you if you can afford it, you can get very good care. If you can't afford it, you can't get good care. There's a you know a huge class gradient in the United States in terms of access to good non-parental care. Um, you know, and I think it shows up <laughs> later, later, later on, you know, that kids have gotten um, by social class quite different, um, often quite different standards of care. Um, what I say in my book is that Americans talk, the Americans we interviewed talked a lot about how wonderful it is to have a family, how fun it is. Um, it's, it just it's really striking in the in the interviews, um, Japan compared to the US. Um, Americans sound much more family oriented. Again, they sound more um, anxious to spend time with the older generation. And um, they talk a lot more about the family as a as completing their life. And Japanese don't quite speak in that way. And I don't think it's, you know, an artifact of, you know, different terms in the two languages or anything. Americans are just very family oriented. This, this society is also, I would say, very, very couple oriented. Um, and Japan is not as much, at least in the terms that I think matter in terms of the birth rate. The reason I use the US and Sweden as contrasting cases with Japan is that US and Sweden have maintained their birth rates for completely different reasons, right? Very different reasons. Um, and also, you know, obviously in the US, we have a very heterogeneous population. Um, and it's easy for people, actually, I often get the comment, well, isn't the US um, birth rate fairly high because of all the immigrants we have. Yes and no. Actually, highly educated American women are getting married at higher rates and having two kids at higher rates than was the case 20 years ago. Far, far higher rates than, um, you know, compared to the total birth rate in Japan. So U.S. is a very complicated case. A lot of individual factors and factors having to do with how receptive um, society, you know, even restaurants and so forth um, is to people with young kids. So we're almost at time, but uh, yeah. hopefully you can hear me now. I apologize. Can you hear me now? Oh, I just thought we can combine several questions that are more future oriented. And uh, we had several audience members ask, uh, where do you see these policies headed in the next 10 years or so? 
specifically if you see the goal of 30% uh, women in leadership being a feasible one to achieve by 2030 as it was postponed. And if you see the Suga administration now making any significant changes or progress towards achieving greater uh, gender parity. And this will be the last question. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, what's encouraging to me um, in terms of gender, greater gender equality in the labor force is indeed that more and more women are in Sogo Shoku track. Um, they're, and they're regular employees, many, many more women than in the past. A lot of women are in contingent employment too, irregular jobs. But um, the women that we interviewed that we have followed um, you know, over these years, almost all of them, now again, they're um, Tandai, Senmon uh, Gakko, or university graduates, almost all of them have kept working um, after they had kids. Um, again, almost all of them are in this short work hour option. And I think, honestly, part of what um, all of this depends on is how Japanese companies deal with women who are, who are working 30 hours a week for one year, two years, or three years. You know, as long as it's only women who do that, it's, you know, it's difficult, right, to um, promote more women into managerial positions. If there were some way to get men to work less hours or to take a short work hour option, I think things would start evening out. Basically, bottom line is, from my point of view, men's lives need to change in Japan. Women's lives have changed a lot, but women don't wanna work like men for very good reasons. And that's been the case for many, many years in Japan. Most women have no desire to work 50 or 60 or 70 hours a week, whether or not they have kids. And it's this gender disparity and you know, expectations at the workplace and also this very thorny issue of how do you measure productivity? Japan has the lowest productivity across the post-industrial world. And it's partly because, largely probably, because the work hours are so long. And when you divide up, you know, these work hours and, and, and you know, the, the productivity that you're getting out of the work hours, it's not much. <laughs> so the rationale for long work hours is really, really fading. Um, we've got, you know, more and more um, uncertainty now because of what COVID has done. Hiroshi Ono gave a very good talk last week at Indiana University from his home in Shitotsubashi. Um, he gave an evening talk about the future of work in Japan. I'm, I think it was probably recorded. It was a webinar. Um, so, you know, to the extent that FaceTime becomes less um, essential in Japan, this could help women in the workforce. Um, but again, you know, if you've got a mommy track that's well established that a lot of women are taking, you gotta, you gotta do something to make, um, make it possible for women who are temporarily probably in the mommy track to succeed. These are women, again, who, they, they want to keep working in their current workplace. And if Japan doesn't, if Japanese companies don't encourage that, they're just, they're just foolish, <laughs> to be honest. I write a, about half a chapter on Jitan, short work hour option. Um, what was the other question? 30% managerial, what was the other question? about the Suga administration? Well, I can't, I can't quite tell yet. Um, right. I think it's pretty much a continuation. I mean, he, he's Abe's buddy, and I think it's pretty, oh, but here's the silver lining. I just remembered what I was going to say. So starting about a year and a half ago, there, there's a small group of LDP lawmakers uh, who, who actually want to make a short paternal, paternity leave mandatory. 
And I'm going to argue for that in the last chapter of my book. It won't make a difference right away in the birth rate, but um, again, I think letting men who want to change their lifestyles a bit in Japan would, would be a really good thing. Because Japanese men just, to my mind, don't face very many options that are considered acceptable lifestyles. And again, that feeds back into the question about why so many are not marrying. They're just not acceptable prospects on the marriage market. Right, thank you for ending on the silver lining. Uh, and thank you again for this wonderful uh, talk. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And I hope that uh, you'll join us next week for our next noon lecture. Thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you for the questions.